is going on everybody and welcome to the saturday the last saturday edition of the regular season stochastic nhl strategy show i am your host josh harris hope you like frosties because that's all you can win if you win the gpps on DraftKings. maybe you can afford a blizzard i know jake will spend the extra couple bucks to get a blizzard because he's a blizzard slappy but here we are and blizzards are really good i just you know and he, Jake didn't make an appearance this year, and I'm salty about it, so I'm going to roast him when I can. What's up, Cliffy? <laughs> uh, hey. Um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe he joins us for playoffs. You never know. Uh, yeah, the contests are a little low. Um, I think they already opened a secondary for the early slate. I don't know. Um, the nice thing is is playoffs are in a week. And at least at the very start of playoffs, the contests are usually pretty good, especially I think there's like an opening day contest that they'll have. So, you you know, a week from today will be a lot better. Today it's kind of downtrodden, but it's a pretty interesting slate of games regardless. We'll talk about them individually, but there are a couple teams maybe resting some players tonight because they played last night and they've already finished a playoff spot. So uh, lots of things will probably change between now and lock. And being up to date on the information will will be pretty important. So hopefully we get news uh, before lock happens. Seven interesting games, I think, individually, um, even if there are some lopsided matchups, I do think that there are basically playable lines in almost every game at, from every team, regardless of your single entry or MME. So uh, kind of like the slate here tonight. Yeah, I think the biggest question mark in terms of lineup will be the Predators because they sat Nyquist and McDonough yesterday. They're back-to-back on the road. Usually coaches don't speak. Wouldn't be shocked to see Forsberg shit sit. Wouldn't be shocked to see <laughs> – he might shit. Uh, it wouldn't be shocking to see Yossi sit. Um, we'll see. That's, that's one of the games you really need to pay attention to at lock. If you're in the Discord, we're usually all over that. Um, So, yeah, I I do like this slate. I wish you could win more than a a large blizzard, but how often have I been up to the top of an MME contest as a single entry player? I can complain about it, but I I think I had one or two sweats in the 15 this season. I make my living in the single entry stuff, so who the fuck am I to complain (laughs) <laughs> Montreal Can- <laughs> Saturday. Montreal Canadiens with a 2.9 total heading into Ottawa. The Senators have a 3.5 total. I don't really understand the ownership on the Sens here compared to the ownership on the Canadiens. 23.9% projected ownership on Ottawa 1, a 26% top two stack. Like both those numbers shock me. Like that top line, their numbers are kind of bleh. like for Ottawa, I guess they're good, but for a top line at that price at 18.5, um, I, I just don't love them at that ownership. Like I'd rather go elsewhere. I'd rather even go Montreal one for $1,100 cheaper in this matchup. Like Pinto, Batherson, Kachuk. Not super high event. Like, if you want a one-off Brady, like, any Kachuk is in play. You know what I mean? As a one-off. So, Brady is fine. I just don't love this line configuration when they're going to be almost 25% owned at 18.5 when there's other lines in that range that I like better. So, you know, the the 15 is a 35 max. So, if you're 35 maxing today, you obviously can do what you want there. In my single entry, I'm out on Ottawa, the second line, 3.3% top two stack, 16% ownership. So that's just the scene in itself. Like, I think one-offs are fine. One-off Kachuk, one-off Grieg, fine. My interest is more on the, the Montreal side. Let's not pretend Ottawa is a good team. They suck. This game sucks. Outside of Montreal 1, because that is an actual good line. I like watching Slavkovsky play. I like watching Caulfield play. Suzuki's just kind of like a stereotypical top six NHL center. 
he's just kind of like that guy. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. He reminds me of Hurdle a little bit. Um, I don't know. Caulfield and Slavkovsky are fun. That line's actually good. Ottawa sucks. Four or 8.5% top two stack percentage, 4.6% projected ownership. They have positive leverage. They're cheaper than Ottawa one. They're coming in at a sixth of the ownership. I like Montreal one here. That's probably the only line in the game that I would consider in single entry. Yeah, I I was kind of kind of surprised to see the ownership because it's not oh, like yeah. well, Ottawa one. Ottawa one's projected ownership is 24%. That's stupid. It's obscene. And like, it's not as if it's not a tough matchup, right? Like the Montreal, they'll probably see the Montreal top line. Montreal top line's generally not been good defensively this season. Um, And Montreal does take penalties. And with the recent power play changes, they took Chikrin off and put Pinto on. And so that top line is perfectly correlated. So in that sense, I get it. Like it's not a bad matchup. Um, they should get their power play opportunities. Montreal's at 4.2 minor penalties taken per game over the last six weeks. The penalty kills generally not been great, but it's 24% ownership on that top line. And the Montreal top line is under 5%. So you're looking at basically five times the ownership on Ottawa and here's the reality of the situation is that in all situations, so even strength power play, the trio of Slavkovsky, Suzuki, and Caulfield has created about 11% more expected goals this season per minute than the top line for Ottawa has. So, and they've scored way more often. It, like the, the goal rate is something like 70% higher. If you want to take away the goal rate because the Pinto Kachuk Batherson line isn't like a massive sample, fine. But by expected goals, the Montreal top line has created more than the Ottawa top line, and the Ottawa top line is coming in at five times the ownership. Like it it just does not make sense to me at all. And it's not as if I don't like Ottawa one in this matchup. I do. I think this is a good matchup for that top line, especially them being perfectly correlated and um going with the four four. Uh, power play configuration but if I have the choice between a let's say 25% Ottawa one or a 5% Montreal one in the same game it's much especially where Montreal one's cheaper $1,100 cheaper (laughs) (laughs) and like even if it was 10% on Montreal one I would still play Montreal instead like it's just an ownership thing and the likelihood of them uh being a top two stack like I'm, I wrote up Brady Kachuk in the picks article. I do like Ottawa. It's just an ownership thing. I'm with you. I, I prefer Montreal 1 way more than Montreal 2, uh, given the ownership discrepancy here. The Montreal second line is a little interesting because Ridley, Greig, and Claude Giroux are going to line up again on the second line, it looks like. Nice. And they just have not been good together this season. Greig and Giroux are up close to 100 minutes without Brady Kachuk because there was some time where Brady Kachuk was their left winger. Any other winger for Brady Kachuk, uh, 67 shot attempts against per 60, 3.8 expected goals against per 60 minutes. They're getting crushed defensively. That second line for Montreal, 65 shot attempts, 4 per 60, 3.4 expected goals, 4 per 60. Um, Joel Armia, over two shots per game uh, over his last 20 games. These guys, you know, Armia, new hook might you know, one because of penalty kill, one because of power play might play like 16, 17 minutes. It, I don't mind like an army and new hook two man or something like that, because I don't think the Ottawa second line is very good, but it is Montreal one I like best in this game. Yeah. And I just saw Gabba Blue. I'll get that link for you. I don't know why I didn't copy it before. I'll put it in the link. I'll put it in the chat for you in a second. Let me just intro the next game and I'll go grab it. Detroit Red Wings with a 2.9 total heading into Toronto. The Leafs have a 3.7 total. I like this game pretty much more than the first game we just talked about, and there's way less ownership here. Let me start on the Detroit side here. Larkin, Debrinkat, Raymond, they were optimal last game. I know Toronto kind of goes away from Matthews getting the shutdown, but it's not like the Tavar- – like Tavares, Martin, and McMahon have been better defensively than Matthews. Bertuzzi Domi, which isn't a shock. Like Domi 
sucks defensively. So that makes sense. But like that line was very, very good. Uh, and yeah, like you look at their season sample, it's not overwhelmingly great numbers, but at the beginning of the season, I don't know. Raymond was finding his footing. He really emerged as the season went on. I, I do like this line at 15, four with 8.1% projected ownership. I'm fine with it. If you're going mid range builds and, and this and that Kay and Perron confer at 7.7% is not something I'm really interested in, even though they're only 12,100. Like it, if you want to leave off to bring cat off the top line and put in Kane for like a power play stack, like, yippee ki that's fine because, you know, the Toronto penalty kill isn't great. But I, I'm more in on Toronto 1 here for, for the Detroit Lions. Now, the Toronto side is more interesting to me. We just talked about a 24% projected line, Ottawa 1 at 18.5. Toronto 1 is 18.9 with 6.3% projected ownership. Max Domi's back. This line has been absolute nitrous. It doesn't matter if Matthews goes out against Larkin or Confer. Both those lines are ass defensively. So I, I really, really like Toronto 1 here. Want to go to Toronto 2? Be my guest. Marner sucks. They have positive leverage, and they're a little bit cheaper than Toronto 1. But I prefer you know Matthews here. He's going for 70 goals, and he's almost there. So, like, that's – we talk about – towards the end of the season playing teams that have something to play for. Matthew says something to play for. That is a milestone he's going to want to hit. So I'm in on Toronto one, uh, but James Reimer. Yeah, that's a bold decision from, from Detroit in a must win game starting James Reimer, but you know, Toronto one, Detroit one, you want to go to the second lines. I prefer Toronto two. Detroit two is just kind of me. Yeah, I'll start on the Detroit side as well because I did write up Dylan Larkin in the picks article today. One thing I couldn't believe is just how cheap Alex DeBrincat has gotten. If you look at his, his price history this season, he peaked at 7900 on DK. He's down to 4700 $3,200 less um, than his peak on the season. And something like $2,800 less than what it was in like mid-January. Um, it certainly has been a big decline. Part of it is, is shooting percentage driven. Like he's over three shots per game in his last 10 games. He just has one goal because he's, he's shooting 3%. Um, you know, those things happen. But what I wrote about in the picks article was that power play match that you mentioned. Like Toronto's power play has just not been that good. Um, basically going back to February now, uh, especially after the all, like after the all-star break. Uh, Detroit, or Toronto, sorry, 20th by shot attempts allowed per minute on the penalty kill and 24th by goals allowed over the last six weeks, taking 3.6 minor penalties per game and the league average is about 3.3. Detroit is doing a good job of drawing power plays. Like their power plays, honestly, a big reason why they're even in a playoff race right now. And Dylan Larkin uh, leads the team both in power play goals per minute and shots per minute uh, with man advantage. So this is a good spot for that top line, two out of the three guys anyway, uh, on the power play. Now, it, it is a tougher matchup going up against Tavares, Marner, uh, and Bobby McMahon. But I was looking at McMahon and Tavares' numbers without Nylander. It's 2.7 expected goals against. Like, that's not that great. Like, it's a, actually a little bit worse than league average. There's nothing that, to be super concerned about. The thing with Detroit is that top line's coming in at 8.1% ownership. We literally just went over the Montreal Canadiens being cheaper um, at about half that ownership rate um, or, you know, much less ownership rate than Ottawa. Now, they're more expensive than Detroit. You can actually play them both. Uh, but the Montreal, the difference is the Montreal top line is perfectly correlated where this one is not, which is like you mentioned, you might want to put in Patrick Kane instead of Debrinkat, uh for some power play stacking. But I don't, I don't mind Detroit one here. Because there are so many lines in that mid price range, they're in play, but they're not like a priority of mine in, in single entry by any measure. I don't have interest in the Detroit depth. If you want to go to Detroit too, uh, especially because Perron and, and Kane are on the top power play unit, like I think that's fine, but it's it's not the spot that I'm targeting. I do like Toronto one. I agree with you. Like that line 
has just been incredible. Like there's not much ownership coming in on them. Uh, 6.3% per the top stacks tool. That Toronto top line, 4.6 expected goals, 7.3 actual goals uh, per 60 minutes. The ice time has gone down for Matthews. Like you probably can't expect more, more than 20 minutes from him. Whereas there are a lot of times he'll play, he's played like 22, 23 minutes. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Like I would trade two minutes of ice time for this efficient of scoring um, that they've shown on that top line. So I, I really do like Toronto one as well. Uh, Toronto two is kind of interesting because they've actually played pretty well together. Marner's kind of dragging them down. <laughs> it's like, it's not what you want to see when you're rolling into playoffs and you're $11 million wing, you're dragging everybody down offensively, but uh, you still get two out of the three guys. On, but the thing is you get two out of the three guys on the top power play unit. They're not that expensive at 17,100. And for the, uh, Toronto's penalty kill struggles, Detroit's been just as bad. Um, bottom five by shots against on the PK and then bottom 10 by goals against on the PK over the last six weeks. So maybe you want to do like Tavares, Marner, Nylander. It feels bad leaving Matthews off. Maybe you want to do like Matthews, Marner and, and Nylander or Matthews, Tavares, Marner, like something like that, just to take advantage of the power play situation. Uh, but at even strength, it is a Toronto top line. I do like in this game. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Columbus Blue Jackets with a 2.6 total. Heading into Nashville, the Predators have a 3.8. So the two games we just talked about were 7 p.m. Eastern. This game starts at 8 p.m. Eastern. The rest, the rest of the game started at 8 p.m. Eastern or later. And this one's kind of important because right now we have the Nashville top line projecting to be Forsberg, O'Reilly, Luke Evangelista, which, which it was last night at 17-1, 18.8. Percent projected ownership 24.5 or excuse me 18.8 percent projected top two stack 24.5 percent projected ownership now they rested nyquist last night i would imagine maybe he comes in for forsberg and evangelista just hops to the other side and it's evangelista nyquist o'reilly something like that it's it's hard to project or they can just sit the same guys again like well we just, I, I i think even ron o'reilly might just get a night off yeah. You know what I mean? O'Reilly might sit. Yeah, it's I, I. One guy I'm pretty sure gets a night off is Roman Yossi. Um, yeah. He only played like 19 minutes last night. It's a back to back. I I honestly do think Yossi comes out and, and Barry comes in and Barry runs the power play. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked. Like Yossi sitting, Forsberg sitting. So this is kind of really important because one, if it's a new combo. It's a really good matchup, and you can get it low owned. Two UFC 300 is tonight, and there's no one going to be paying attention to Nashville line rushes on a Saturday anyway. So, like, you, you're going to get yourself a low owned combo, unless it's Forsberg, O'Reilly, Evangelista again, which I don't think it's going to be. It's a really good matchup. If Forsberg sits, that obviously really hurts that line, but like. Like the line's going to be like thirteen thousand if if O'Reilly sits, so it's still a really good spot. Columbus sucks. Like it doesn't matter what the lines are for Columbus; they all suck. So I'm interested in whatever Nashville one iteration is, and I hope we don't get news until warmups. So I'm in on Nashville one. It's kind of hard to project Nashville two and three. Because of that, on the Columbus side, I these are just very, very cheap lines, right? So, like, if you're power play stacking Toronto or something like that, you may want to do some sort of, you know, Vronkoff, Gudrow, two-man or something like that. It's just, you know, if Yossi's out, that hurts them. It hurts the Predators defensively. But if McDonough comes back in, you know, he's had an excellent season. So, like, I don't particularly love Columbus, but if you are trying to power play stack, this is a good, a decent spot to grab a cheap two-man from. Yeah, I, I mean, I won't even bring up, like, the the line tools or anything because I don't think they're very useful for this game. We, like, we have no idea what the lines are going to be. Here's the thing with Columbus as well is Alex Nylander started that game on the fourth line on Thursday, whatever it was, Thursday, Wednesday. Um he was back up on the top line, but I think by the start of the third period and they were back to Nylander, Voronkov, Godro. And 
That's been a good line in a small sample. And I even wrote up um, Dmitry Voronkov in the picks article uh, because him and Gojo have been playing so well together. Uh, at 5 on 5 this season, 34.8 shots, 3.1 expected goals, 3.8 actual goals per 60 minutes with Gojo and Voronkov on the ice together. And if O'Reilly and Forsberg sit out tonight, I'm not really that concerned with the matchup, right? Like, um, I don't think they really have a shutdown line that they can send. Like, they could send Colton Sissons and Jason Zucker or whatever, but I don't think that's enough of a shutdown line to really make me concerned. And, you know, Nylander, Godron, Voronkov would be perfectly correlated on the power play at 12,400. So they're a perfectly cor- they would be a perfectly correlated top line getting a pretty easy matchup. Um, I don't mind Columbus 1 in that sense. Now, we don't have confirmation on that. We didn't get a lot, any line rushes from Columbus this morning. So if people just want to go play Sillinger, Marchenko, and Texier uh, instead because they need a cheap line, I think that's okay. But I would try to get that Nylander, Bronkov, Gojo combination if you need a filler. And the thing is, is like if they don't end up on a line in warmups and you need to change it, like there's a lot you could swap to later in the slate, right? Um, like San Jose in particular uh, has some line combinations you go to. Certainly Anaheim, uh, you know, depth from Minnesota, depth from Pittsburgh. Uh, depending what Edmonton does with their lines, there could be some uh, changes or there could be some pretty cheap line combinations there. So I'm not super worried about being stuck without being able to play a, a full line if I do play Columbus one here tonight. So I honestly don't mind them at their price, assuming that they are together. We'll have to wait until warmups on the Nashville side. Like it's just tough to say what to play. Like, cause like you said, I, I think it, there's a, especially because it's Columbus, like it's a non-conference opponent, non-conference lottery team, play non-playoff opponent you know what i mean like there's there's no reason for nashville to risk anything with any player in this game i i think there's a good chance that you know nyquist and mcdonough come back but all of yossi uh o'reilly and forsberg sit and in that case like what am i playing from nashville like Novak maybe evangelista nyquist that's, that's the thing like maybe you go play novak evangelista and then whomever's on their wing or something like that i think that's fine it's certainly a swap that you can go to I just kind of worry about not having um, not having Yossi in the lineup. He's a big engine for them on the blue line. I think I'd prefer just to play one-offs, like play one-off Novak, play one-off Barry, assuming that he's in, like those types of things, and I would be stacking anything from Nashville. Yeah, and all this is just conjecture, too. Like, we have no idea what their lineup's going to be, so. I mean, maybe they just play everybody, but it yeah. is a back-to-back. Like, I don't yeah. see it happening. Yeah, me either, but, like, <laughs> neither of us know. We'll know at 7.38 p.m. Eastern. Boston Bruins with a 3.1 total heading into Pittsburgh. The Penguins have a 2.9. I'm kind of unsure about this game because I kind of like both sides. I don't really want to play them. Like Boston's a pretty good defensive team. Like Crosby Rust. Riley Smith have been very, very good. Like Rust and Crosby have been excellent, as Cliffy has mentioned, basically all season. Uh, They're coming in with positive leverage. Like the top lines for Boston and Pittsburgh are both priced right around Ottawa 1, and they have combined a third of an ownership as Ottawa 1 here. So in that sense, I think Pittsburgh 1 is a pretty good MME play. I'm kind of leaning towards liking Boston one a bit more just because, you know, Pittsburgh isn't as good defensively as Boston. So I I don't know if I'd full stack Pasternak, Zaka, Heinen. Fine with, you know, Pittsburgh has a pretty good, that's okay, I guess. Like they, they have a pretty good penalty kill. So like, I don't think you need to go power play style here. I think you go like Zasha, Pasternak, Pasternak, Heinen, something like that. If you want a full stack, I think it's fine. They're 18 1, almost a 10% top two stack, 6.7% projected ownership. But, like, at that point, like, I think I'd rather play Montreal one again. I'd rather play Toronto one. So, like, it, like I don't see myself prioritizing them in my single entry lineup. They're circled. Um, but I don't know. They're both in play. I just don't think I'm going to get there. Pit two is also in play. Malcolm Bunting, Raquel, they've been great at 13 8. That is a filler. 
with not too much negative leverage that I'd be considering over some of the other stuff like Detroit two at obscene ownership, Ottawa two at obscene ownership. You know what I mean? So pit two would be a filler I prefer over the higher owned stuff, but both top lines for me, I think it'd be more if I was playing, uh, if I was MMEing the 15. Yeah, I, I, I will say I don't have a ton of interest in Pittsburgh. Um, we did in the last game, which worked out well. I think we were on pit two more than pit one, which isn't great. You know, uh, those things happen. But yeah, these Boston lines have been pretty good defensively. The top line, 2.4 expected goals against. The second line, 2.3 expected goals against. Both lines, actual goals against numbers are at 2.0 or less. And the Boston penalty kill, which kind of struggled pretty hard in the middle of the season, actually, has been a lot better over the last six to eight weeks um, at the bare minimum middle of the league or middle of the road. And it's not like Pittsburgh has a great power play anyway. But you want to look for reasons to play them. And there just aren't a lot considering how good these Boston lines are at five on five and how good the, or how much better the penalty kill has gotten over the last couple months. So I'm not in so much on Pittsburgh. I will also say there's no, I don't think there's an official confirmation on Riley Smith on the top line. Like I know we got moved up there on the last game. Drew O'Connor had been there for a little while. I, I suspect that either player might not last that long, whether they start the game on the top line or not. It's more about Rust and Crosby anyway, but um I do kind of like that Pittsburgh second line, like again, but again, 13,800, like we just went over a perfectly correlated Columbus line, uh, top line, top power play that is cheaper uh, and will probably have less ownership because it's going to be um, a combination you swap to at, at warmups. So out on Pittsburgh, I'm with you on Boston one. I kind of like them in this matchup. I'm not worried about the Crosby matchup. Uh, you know, with Drew O'Connor there, it was 2.8 expected goals against. That's below average. The actual goals against was really bad. Like, that's the thing about Pittsburgh. This recent run that they've been on, it's not the goaltending that's been great. It's the offense that has finally started to score. And that's a difference. And that matters for DFS. It's not like they're winning these a bunch of games 2-1. They're winning a bunch of games like 5-3 and 6-5 and, and things like that. So um, there is... A good opportunity for Boston here. Like the Pittsburgh penalty kill has not been as good as it was, you know, before the All Star break. Um, that Pasternak, Hind, and Zach line has been pretty good offensively. Three expected goals, uh, uh, five point seven actual goals. So like they're filling the net. But one thing I noticed going through some other data was Dan Heinen's having a great playmaking season. And I think that just kind of fits perfectly for the top line because Zach is a guy that can finish. Like he can score 20 goals and Heinen can kind of feed him. And if not, they just give the puck to Pasternak, which pretty good option to have at the very least. I really do like Pasternak as a one-off um, here tonight, but as Boston one, I like best in this game. Yeah, I agree with you there. Vancouver Canucks with a three total. Heading into Edmonton, the Oilers have a 3.4. McDavid remains out. As far as we know, the top line is going to be Hyman, Dreisaitl, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, second line Kane, Fogel, Henrique. Vancouver going JT Miller, Besser, Suter, Pedersen, Hoglander, Mikheyev, and then Garland, Lindholm, Dakota, Joshua. Since Lindholm's going back, the coach wants to try to get three good lines going. It's fine. Not going to complain about it because he puts Suter back with Miller and Besser. And that's all I care about. Uh, that line has been absolute nitrous this season, and no one's playing them again. They have 0.2% projected ownership, 16,600. I really, really like them. Leon Dreisaitl is not Connor McDavid. Go look at the Wowies. Dreisaitl's like just below the day. Look at his numbers with and without McDavid. It's it's a stark comparison. The dif in a small sample, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Drysaddle, Hyman have pretty decent defensive numbers, but McDavid's missed the last two games, and the last two games are against Arizona and a an, uh, Vegas team that was missing a couple guys, important pieces. So if it is Leon Drysaddle going up against JT Miller, Besser Suter, I – prefer J.T. Miller, Brock Besser, Pia Suter. That line has been excellent offensively, excellent defensively. Uh, they try to get Quinn Hughes out with that line to like 
I am very much in on J.P. Miller, Besser, Suter. Um, you want to play Pedersen, Hogland, or Mikheyev because Kane, Fogel, Henrique are probably not going to be a good defensive line. Then do what you need to do there. But I much prefer uh, Miller, Besser, Suter. On the Edmonton side, like, yeah, the top line, 21-7 with a 14.6% top two stack with 2, 2.5% projected ownership. I don't particularly love them. As a full stack, you want to one-off Hyman, you want to one-off dry side, I'll find. But, like, I honestly prefer the Vancouver side for DFS, despite Edmonton having the bigger total. Yeah, I I really don't like Edmonton in this game. I, I get it. Casey DeSmith is starting again. He's certainly seen his struggles um, over the last couple of weeks. But no McDavid is a big loss. And it's not like this is an easy matchup, right? Like, the one thing about the Vancouver Canucks is that they've been pretty good defensively basically all season. That's why they thought they could kind of survive, um, you know, giving Thatcher Demko as much time as he needed to, to, to get healthy for the playoffs. Like, Vancouver's penalty kill has been one of the best in the NHL uh, for a while now. And if you just look at the last six weeks, which includes some Demko, but mostly uh, Casey Smith, um, Vancouver has the fourth lowest expected goals against rate uh, at five on five and the second lowest goals against rate. The only team lower is Los Angeles. And we treat Los Angeles like the plague when it comes to stacking. Um, I don't have a lot of interest in Edmonton, especially where – Listen, they can still catch like a regulation win for Edmonton tonight puts them one point behind the Canucks with a game in hand for the division title. So they can still get in. But I don't think it's that big of a difference for them for the playoffs. Like, I wonder if they're looking at it like that, because like if they overtake Vancouver, then they play Nashville. Right. If they don't overtake Vancouver, they play Los Angeles. Like, is there do you really want to risk losing Dreisaitl or Bouchard or Hyman or even Skinner to an injury to go play the Nashville Predators instead. Like, I don't really see that as, as necessarily worth it. Maybe they see it differently. We won't know until warmups. I'm not convinced that McDavid is going to be the only guy that doesn't play here tonight. Like if they don't want to push it with him. And it's not only that is that starting with last night's game, the Oilers are finishing the season with five games in seven days, including two sets of back to backs. I don't think they want to push their players that hard. And the only reason I think they might play is because the division crown is, is, is possible. Uh, like all this is to say, I have no real interest in the Oilers. I certainly don't have interest in the top line. Kane Fogel and Henrique is a little interesting because they're priced as like a filler stack. And Kane and Fogel have been pretty high event with uh, any center, but McDavid and dry settle. Like I looked at their numbers with like, uh, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, uh, Derek Ryan, Ryan McLeod, like those types of guys, certainly Adam Henrique. Three point, um, sorry, 3.8 expected goals for 3.3 against. Like they create a lot, but they allow a lot. And maybe they can create something against the depth uh, from Vancouver, but I don't have a lot of interest in Edmonton. I have more interest in the Vancouver side here. I did write uh, Vancouver in the picks article today. Uh, and like you mentioned, this has been the best iteration of their second line this season. 34 and a half expected goals, 3.7 expected goals, 4.8 actual goals per 60 minutes in 176 minutes together. And again, I'm not convinced that Edmonton plays everybody here tonight. So I like Vancouver too. They're coming in with no ownership, 0.2%. Maybe it comes up a little bit if we get word that the Oilers are going to sit some players, but I really don't think so. Uh, Edmonton too for me in this game, especially or Vancouver too. Sorry, especially where it's not a particularly great power play matchup, and I'm not running to get Elias Pettersson in my lineups. I think Vancouver too is perfectly playable here tonight. Yeah, I think Edmonton's going to save their sitting for the back to backs, like the back end of both back to backs. So I think you may see a pretty full lineup tonight. Maybe they sit a guy. I don't know. Who knows? Who am I? I don't. I'm nobody. Anaheim Ducks with a two point total. 2.0 total. The disrespect. It is a brutal matchup, though. Heading into Los Angeles, the Kings have a 3.5. Um, let me get this game loaded. I don't know why I was not prepared. There we go. Ducks are on a back-to-back. -back. 
Like, I'll just start with the Ducks because I don't have a ton of interest in the Ducks here. It's a two total, back to back on the road in a miserable matchup. The one thing I will say, if you're looking to power play stack, the Leafs, the Car Edmonton, I don't mind Vitrano, Zeger, Strom. They've been good. It's still not a good matchup, but they're 11 9. Like Frank Vitrano was almost 11 9 by himself in December. He was like eight. He was, I, I'm pretty sure there was a game where he hit almost 8K. He was like the Brinkat's price for a while there. So, you know, he scored yesterday. He has 34 goals. I'm not running out to play them. Don't get me wrong. But if you're looking to power play stack, I think you can take a piece or two from there. My interest is on the Kings side here. I think there's three playable lines, uh, maybe even four, if you really wanted to. Like, legitimately. I think uh, my interest would go Kopitar line one, Deneau line as two, then Dubois, Laferriere, Akil Thomas three, and then Fiala, Lazat, Lewis is four. Like, just play what you want. I think you want to prioritize the power play guys, though, because this is an excellent power play matchup. So that's why I like Kopitar Kempe. You want to leave Byfield off, add Arvinson in. Fine. You want to add a lower own power play one guy in, go with Fiala. Just you can full on power play stack. This is a great matchup for them. So I think there is a lot you can do with the Kings here. And the Ducks, I'm out on unless you're power play stacking an MME and you need a cheap two man. Yeah, I won't go. I just don't have any interest in Anaheim. Like we just, I just mentioned how Los Angeles has the lowest goals against uh, over the last six weeks. Like they play um, the, a very trappy style and I don't think Anaheim's going to break through that uh, back to back on the road uh, with the Kings going rested with going with their full lineup. So uh, no interest in Anaheim other than in MME. The Los Angeles side, I did write up the top line in the picks article, mainly because for the reasons that you mentioned. It's a great power play matchup. Anaheim's at 4.7 minor penalties taken per game this season. It's the most on the sl- or over the last six weeks. They have taken they have given up the most power plays per game this season, and it's by like a half power play per game. It's not even close. Um, wildly undisciplined. In fact, I was looking at something earlier. Over the last six weeks, the Ducks have given up 31 power play goals against. The next two worst teams have given up 36 combined. So the Ducks are in 32nd with 31 goals against, and then 30th and 31st have given up 36. Like th- This has just been an abysmal pe- penalty-killing run basically all season for Anaheim. Uh, the top line, two out of three guys on the top power play unit. The other thing is... And, and I agree. Like, if you want to take off Byfield and put in Fiala, take off Byfield, put in Arvidsson, I think those things are fine. You want a power play stack, just put all five guys from the unit on. I think that's fine as well. The other thing is, is they've been using Phil Deneau more in shutdown matchups. Like, against Calgary, he went out ex- almost exclusively against, against the backland Sharon Govich line. Um, for What that means for tonight is going out against the secret stroke Toronto line. And... Well, they've been good offensively. Boy, howdy, have they been bad defensively. Uh, 70 shot at 7-0 shot attempts against per 60 minutes, 3.2 expected goals against per 60 minutes. It's the best matchup uh, at 5-on-5 five five on the Ducks' side. That's pre- why I like Kings 1. So LA 1 for me in this game. If you want to go to LA 2, uh, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, but uh, Kings 1 is getting less ownership. At 7.1%, I think they do come in a, a little bit lower owned. So a little bit lower owned. Two out of three guys on the top power play unit. Better 5-on-5 five five matchup. I'm in on Los Angeles one in this game. Yeah, I mean, like, LA2 is going to get Carlson, right? And good ass. I mean, you know, that's the best that they got. So, yeah, it makes more sense to get the two power play guys on the Kings one and against an idiotic defensive line. You know what I mean? Oh, God. Minnesota Wild with a 3.5 total. Heading into San Jose, the idiotic Sharks have a 2.5 total. This game sucks. Um, like, why? Like, Joe Ox and Eck played 14 minutes last night. We still have him projected in. Probably going to play, but like 24-4 for that top line. 
on this slate is just banana lands. I don't if I don't I don't want to full stack them. One off cappers off fine. I kind of like the second line here, Rossi Hartman, Johansson at 12 6, 5.6% projected ownership. I think the top line I'm out on, you can one off those guys. I don't want to spend 24 4. I don't care if they're playing against the empty net. Like I just don't want to spend 24 4 on anyone other than a Colorado one or a McDavid line. Minnesota two is interesting. I like Rossi, Hartman, Johansson. I think you can full stack, take two of the guys there. Like the the Wild looked awful last night, and like that's kind of making me consider the Sharks. Like I don't think I'm going to get there, but like at least I put some thought into Grandlands that are in Eklund, which is more you, the more you can say than most Sharks slates. Like I just don't like the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is just x out the sharks kind of like steve buscemi and in, in uh when he's the the killer and crosses out what the fuck billy madison yeah then i put the lipstick on and i laid back down for two more hours to just cross out the sharks but like grandland zetterland eklund i guess is in consideration because the wild just look atrocious they've kind of just mailed it in they've had a disappointing season they're out of the playoffs minnesota two is still my favorite line in this game but you know this game sucks. Yeah, I'll just real quick on on San Jose. One reason to play the San Jose top line is they're perfectly correlated, right? And the one spot where Minnesota has struggled all season, regardless of coach, regardless of goalie, et cetera, et cetera, is on the penalty kill. And <laughs> the Sharks, I love it. the end of the season. Over the last six weeks, the Sharks have the seventh highest goal rate on the power play in the league. They've scored more often than Vancouver and Edmonton. Now, they're doing that because they're shooting 24%, and that's too high to be sustainable. But there's 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 a week left in the season, uh, or five days left in the season, basically. That's as small a sample as you can get, and it's a good power play matchup for San Jose 1. They do play 20-plus minutes a game. There is a six percent top two stack percentage on them, which like I, I think the highest, that's the highest it's been all season. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh twelve point one percent ownership, like it's fine, but it's it's the same thing again. I'm gonna go to back to Columbus. They're twelve thousand four hundred perfectly correlated top line, they're cheaper. Um, and they're certainly going to come in with a lot less than 12.1% ownership. There's just another pivot that I would go to personally, but I think San Jose one's fine just because of the power play matchup. Um, yeah, I think Minnesota one's a little bit too expensive. Like maybe they rebound, but maybe the coach just blows up the lines, right? It's certainly possible. He's right? Kind of- like um, he was not happy with the veterans last night. Maybe he – like Rossi, it was just like a week ago, Rossi was on the top line instead of Erickson Eck. Maybe they do that. And the top line isn't perfectly it, – actually, it might still be perfectly correlated because Rossi's on the power play now. Um, but you could be kind of stuck swapping down it to a guy that's like $3,000 cheaper and leaving a lot of money on the table. I'm kind of with you on Minnesota too. Rossi and Hartman have been good together under John Hines. 70 shot attempts, 2.8 expected goals per 60 minutes. Um, Ro- I put Rossi in the, in the picks article mainly because he is on the top power play. And San Jose's given up the most shots – per minute on the penalty kill over the last six weeks. Uh, Minnesota not drawing a lot of power plays, but against a penalty kill, giving up the most shots in the league. You don't need a ton of power plays to score at least once. I don't mind the second line from Minnesota, but where this is the last game to lock, I guess Anaheim, Los Angeles is locking at the same time. If there is some sort of crazy line swap, like, you know, Liam Ogren, had a good game last night. Maybe they kind of reward him and move him up with Boldy and then put Boldy down on the second line and then move Marcus Johansson down or Ryan Hartman down or something like that. You know what I mean? Like I can see them doing something like that. You know, they're eliminating from playoffs. This is a lottery team they're up against. Maybe they want to see what the young guys look like. I just think there are kind of too many variables to go and spend half my salary cap on a line that um, honestly didn't look that good last night in what wasn't a terrible matchup. So um, it kind of was. Uh, either <laughs> way. Um, 
Either way, I don't have a lot of interest in Minnesota. It'd be more one-offs. Like, I th- one-off Capra's off is always in play. One-off Matt Boldy. Boldy still played 19 minutes last night. Like, that's fine. Certainly one-off Marco Rossi, at, I think it's 4,300 on DK. I think that's perfectly fine. I'm just not stacking anyone. Yeah. This game sucks. Let's talk about defensemen. I have five that I like from the top end to 5,000. I'm going to rank them in a second, but I just want to tell you that Wierenski, I think Wierenski is fine. Bouchard's fine. Quinn Hughes is fine. Even Chikrin, like Riley. But the five in order that I like, Mike Matheson, numero uno, baby. Uh, number two, Charlie McAvoy. Uh, number three, Drew Doughty. Number four, Brock Faber. Number five, Maurice Cedar. Yeah, uh, I have Wierenski number one on, on my board. That's with the assumption that Roman Yossi sits tonight. Um, right. If he plays, he'd be Absolutely. number one. He, yeah, he, he'd be number one easily because it's Columbus. But I'm um, assuming Yossi sits. I have Wierenski number one, Matheson number two, uh, and then Quinn Hughes number three. Mainly because I am expecting Edmonton to sit some players. If they don't, Quinn Hughes would drop. But like, I still like um, Hughes regardless. Pretty good night for the mid price range. Like, you do have Riley uh, at home against Detroit. Detroit. We mentioned how bad their penalty kill is. I'm not typically in favor of playing Toronto defensemen, but I think this is a really good matchup. Uh, I wrote up Charlie McAvoy. It's a good matchup on the road against Pittsburgh. He's only 5,400. Like this is a guy that was a thousand dollars cheaper for a good chunk of the seat, or a thousand dollars more expensive for a good chunk of the season. Bro- Brock Faber's in play. Like if you don't want to stack Minnesota and you just want to uh, get a piece of the power play, I think like just going with Brock Faber is fine. Like Jake Sanderson. He's the lone guy running the top power play for Ottawa. It's a great power play matchup against Montreal here tonight. I think Sanderson is fine. Like, and then Cedar and Doughty. So there's a lot of guys in that mid price range that I do like. It's a lot of cheap guys as well. Like I assume Tyson Berry comes in for Roman Yossi and plays the top power play tonight for Nashville. And he's 3,600 on DK, 3,600 on FanDuel as well. Uh, Racco Gudis, he's going to have to block a lot of shots against Los Angeles here tonight. I have, I have a feeling uh, Erica Branson, same thing against Nashville. Jordan Harris has been getting 20 minutes a game for Montreal, assuming uh, Caden Gooley isn't back tonight. Uh, here's something I was thinking about. How many defensemen would Edmonton have to sit tonight for Cody Cece to be the top power play guy? At least three, right? At least three. They need to sit Bouchard, Nurse. And Ekholm. Ekholm. Um, then maybe Vincent Desar- Descharnay. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, too. It might be four. <laughs> um <laughs> But if they do sit a couple defensemen, Cody CC is certainly going to have to play a lot of minutes. If they don't sit anybody, like there are a lot of defensemen 3K and under uh, in the late games that you can swap to anyway. So I'm not that worried about it. A couple cheap guys. Zach Bogosian, he's been getting a lot of ice time for Minnesota. It's a great matchup. Like if you need a mid price guy, I think he's fine. Same thing with Simon Edmondson uh, from Detroit. Yeah, we got a block bonus from him. Back to back games. Living the dream there. Yeah. Talk about some goalies, even though I don't want to. Min Price, Jesper Wallstead against the Sharks. That's going to be overwhelming chalk. It doesn't matter who is Min Price. It could be Matt Nihas, Min Price. People, he would get 10% ownership. Jesper Wallstead's coming off a shutout of the uh, Blackhawks on April 7th. He's just going to be wildly popular. Whatever you want to do there. Like what's what's your best guess? My guess is like single entry probably thirty two percent. I was gonna go higher. I, I think he's gonna be you know forty to forty five percent. Okay. I mean, yeah. I, I honestly, I could see him like honestly pushing fifty percent depending on the contest. But yeah, uh, he yeah. There's gonna be a lot of Jesper Wallstead lineups. So let's talk about some uh, pivots. Um. Top end, I think it's Linus Allmark for me. You want to go to the Nashville or LA starter, that's fine, but it is Allmark at the top end. I know, and I've said it every time, this is not how leverage works for goalies or NHL DFS, but I don't mind Caden Primo here tonight. He'll be low owned because uh, Ottawa is going to be high owned. Not how leverage works. It could middle, you know, like Ottawa could score two. Ottawa one could score two and Primo gets the win and you're both fine. You know what I mean? So that's not how leverage works, but I don't mind it there. Mackenzie Blackwood is interesting because Minnesota looked atrocious yesterday. I don't know if the coach can light a fire under their ass because their season's over. So like 
I like Blackwood anyway, but this is a pretty good spot. Like both game, both goalies in the Sharks wild game sucks, but like Blackwood would, I would imagine is going to be way lower owned than Jesper Wallstead. Yeah. I mean, I had five names in my list. Uh, Wallstead obviously was one of them because uh, he's 6,500. On DK, uh, Mackenzie Blackwood, I mean, I had Devin Cooley, but Mackenzie Blackwood's perfectly fine at 7K on DraftKings, and I think he's the pivot away. I also had Caden Primo. Uh, he's played well, and I – like, Ottawa's, <laughs> Ottawa's not that good. Like I, They're I, awful. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what everybody is so high on Ottawa about. Uh, Columbus is kind of interesting for me here tonight. Jack Greaves is starting again. <clears throat> he's been playing pretty well for them in a small sample. And again, I think it's a game where Nashville might sit a bunch of guys. So might not have to face Philip Forsberg and Roman Yossi and all that. Like I don't, there's no other goalie at 6,500, but I do think there are a bunch of goalies like 7,200 and less that are pivots away from a super popular wall stead. If you don't want to play him. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think the, the expensive guy is all Mark. Um, Pittsburgh can generate a lot of shots and their power play sucks. So as long as he doesn't get filled in uh, at five on five, he should be perfectly fine. I had a joke there. I'm going to keep it to myself. Uh, yeah, good idea. <laughs> Who are you liking for your hat trick pick? Uh, I'm just talking about how much I don't like Ottawa, but I'm going Brady Kachuk. Kachuk is fine. Like, if you said Ridley Greek, I would have jumped through the screen and, like, tried to jump guillotine. I'm going Brock Star, Brock Besser. Yeah, all right. I like, I like Vancouver here. I, I'm a Vancouver slappy. And yeah, we've been I, Vancouver slappies all season. Yeah. Hasn't worked out the, as uh, super well over the last three or four months. Well, you know why? I figured out why. Because every morning after Vancouver doesn't do anything, in the Discord, there's one guy, daily deposit frostbacks, like, man, I got to stop playing Vancouver. <laughs> it is his fault. Yeah, uh, I'll play frostback too. I have no problem yeah. with that. He's the fall guy. If we need a Haas was the fall guy, he disappeared. Frostback's the new fall guy. But um, we will be back at least once next week, depending on the GPPs. We want to have a regular season send off for you guys. Hopefully the playoff contests are good enough that we'll be here. We'll discuss that with you next week. Uh, but good luck, everybody. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you. Good luck tonight, everybody. <laughs>